Uh, thank you very much, Michael, and, and thanks uh, to um, the entire department for inviting me here, especially on the occasion of uh, a lecture that uh, bears uh, Phil's name. Uh, it's uh, really uh, a, a, an amazing contribution you made in the early years of this institute, putting uh, together this uh, a group of people, or the kernel of this group of people that led to what it is today. I was uh, convinced again today of uh, what a fantastic environment it is. I, I got to see a good number of young people that I've never met before, and it's uh, amazing the, the range of activities that, uh, that go on here now. Um, like many of you here, I'm interested in how uh, neural circuits shape uh, the behavior of animals. And of course, this is a, a very large question. I'm going to uh, talk today specifically about the control of uh, defensive behaviors. And uh, we would like to ultimately uh, reverse engineer the system somehow and understand how the brain goes all the way from uh, early visual signals in the retina through various intermediate stages to, um, oops. <clears throat> to um, the uh, control of motor output. And this is, of course, a, a very large problem. Uh, uh, today, I can only give you something like a research plan with some intermediate results, but I hope to uh, give you a sense of how we'd like to go about to uh, connect these various stages of organization of the, of the nervous system. But I want to start out with some uh, kind of uh, meta-level comments on uh, how to choose a research subject, and uh, this might be interesting to some of the uh, younger members of the, of the audience. Um, let me see if I can just do it this way. Uh, so how, how do you pick a, a problem? How do you choose what animal to work on and what behavior to work on, given that there are thousands of choices on both uh, uh, the rows and columns of that uh, matrix? And uh, uh, there is a principled framework for this that uh, uh, emerged in the, the uh, mid 20th century that uh, suggests that uh, for every brain function, for every kind of uh, behavior you might be interested in, there is some organism, some animal that does it best. And that uh, you should pick that organism and uh, uh, study its specializations for these uh, abilities that uh, it has evolved. And that led, of course, to a beautiful um, a spectrum of studies on the behaviors of uh, barn owls, uh, the, which I'll mention again in a moment, uh, famous for their auditory localization, and uh, bats that do echolocation, and bees that communicate by dancing, and birds that can learn a song for a lifetime. Uh, and this is really a, a fantastic body of work that has been stimulated by this, this idea that you should choose the animal that uh, best exemplifies uh, uh, what uh, you would like to understand about the brain. Now, in recent years, this uh, lofty principle has run into some issues to do with research funding uh, because the official line now is that you can only work on four animals. Um, and uh, I realize that some of you uh, work outside of this uh, narrow spectrum, but you have to increasingly justify why it's reasonable to do so. And of course, there are good arguments for working on these four animals, uh, molecular genetic tools being, being one of them. But obviously, this runs into the, uh, the whole philosophy of neuroethology in a serious way, uh, how to deal with that. Uh, so some of us have uh, developed what I would call reverse neuroethology uh, along the lines of reverse genetics. So uh, suppose you're forced to work with a particular animal. You can still ask. What is the behavior that this animal does best? What is it famous for? And then focus on that, and in that way, uh, hope that you're in a similar corner, maybe, as the original neuroethologists. So let me give you an example. This is, of course, a paradigmatic example of a neuroethology approach. Uh, the barn owl has evolved these all these fantastic features, incredibly silent wings and a ruff of feathers that amplifies the sound and big eyes that capture whatever photons are left in the environment. Why? In order to hunt these little creatures uh, by uh, their auditory system alone. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> wonderful progress has been made in understanding the brain of this uh, animal that's adapted to that task. 
But you should also ask yourself, who forced the barn owl to evolve all these fantastic abilities? And of course, it's the little rodent down here <laughs> because it is so good at running away from barn owls, yeah? such that in fact, when in dim light, there's no way the owl will catch this rodent because it will escape based on its visual capabilities. And uh, even in complete darkness, it's a difficult task. So uh, uh, the idea is uh, take the same picture, but focus on the other end of the photograph and work on the ability of small rodents to run away from uh, aerial threats. Uh, they're extremely good at that, and you can replicate uh, the uh, uh, behavior in the laboratory. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, put the mouse in a, a small arena that has uh, in one corner a, a nest, which the animal perceives as a shelter, and we cover the roof of the arena with a display monitor. And on the monitor, we put a simulation of an approaching owl. You don't have to be terribly realistic about this. In fact, an expanding dark disk is uh, very effective, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so we give the animal about five minutes or so to explore the arena and get comfortable with it. And then at some point, we present this expanding disk on the roof of the monitor. Here we're looking into the side of the arena. There's the nest in the corner. and. Uh, this mouse is a, a standard laboratory mouse. Uh, it's come straight from the breeder. Uh, its ancestors have not seen an owl for about 50 generations or so. Uh, so you might worry, does it still have the innate abilities? Um, it's also the first time the animal is in this box, uh, and obviously the first time that it sees uh, what's going to happen on the monitor. Uh, you'll see this dark spot appearing up here, but my student, uh, uh, Melis has put a little icon down here so we can uh, uh, see better when that happens. So let's uh, watch the animal behave here. Okay, I think we'll get another repeat of the movie. And if you look closely, you'll find that it takes about 0.2 or 0.25 seconds from the appearance of the spot on the ceiling to when the animal is crouched and accelerating towards the nest. Now, half the time, the animals do something different, and that's illustrated here. This is a different mouse. Again, the first exposure to the arena, first expo exposure to the stimulus. <laughs> when I first saw this, I didn't have the convenient icon in the bottom right. And I was convinced that the video had stopped running somehow. But uh, obviously, the, the mouse is suspended here in space and time. Its uh, uh, tail is sticking out straight. It's difficult to see any kind of movement. Uh, when we go and check, they are still breathing, but uh, um, just barely. Anyway, it's still monitoring the environment and eventually becomes unstuck uh, when the stimulus stops. And, uh, <laughs> Slinks off into the corner. <laughs> In any case, so uh, <clears throat> the, this, this happens 100% uh, of the time. Uh, you put an animal in, into this box and expose it to this uh, looming stimulus. Uh, <clears throat> these are very primitive ethograms where every row of the plot is one animal. Uh, this is a time axis. The expanding spots start at time zero. Uh, when you see a red bar, that's escape to the nest. When you see a purple bar, that's uh, prolonged freezing. And when you see a light blue bar, that's the animals rearing up and uh, looking around and, uh, in this exploratory posture. Um, the uh, behavior is quite sensitive to the visual uh, properties of the visual stimulus. So for example, if you just uh, dim the ceiling, let's say you put a big disc on it and make the disc dimmer, you get uh, far fewer reactions. Uh, mostly you get rearing reactions. The animals are curious about what happens on the ceiling, but and occasionally and late you get uh, escape reactions. Uh, if you produce this stimulus, which also has an advancing dark edge, but it's advancing inward rather than outward, again, uh, much reduced uh, uh, escape responses. Um, so we wondered, of course, why do the animals uh, freeze sometimes and escape some other times. And it turns out to depend on the conditions in which you do this behavioral test. In particular, if you offer the animals a shelter in the way that I showed you a moment ago, then about half the time they will freeze and half the time they will escape. And in fact, the same animal will make different choices on different trials. Uh, whereas if you don't offer them that, uh, that shelter, uh, the animals will freeze almost all the time. 
and uh, run away uh, only rarely. And this you know, makes sense if uh, there's no place uh, of safety, then uh, your best choice is probably to try and fade into the background and hope that the owl hasn't spotted you yet. Now, <clears throat> we wondered whether the animals make this choice about escaping or freezing uh, at the moment that the threat appears, uh, do they assess their environment, look around, and then decide to run to shelter? Or uh, is something else involved? So uh, here's a, a movie that uh, uh, you should find interesting. So we're looking again into the arena. This is a slightly bigger box. Uh, here's the animal. Here's this uh, shelter. It looks transparent to you, but it's uh, going to be opaque to the mouse. So it's uh, like a red plastic shelter. Uh, everything is done under infrared illumination, so any of the lights you see here are not visible to the animal. But we will project a stimulus from the uh, above onto the screen, which is visible from below. Um, so you have to pay attention here because uh, various things are going to happen. The animal will walk over into the corner, then something funky is going to happen to its shelter, and then a stimulus, uh, expanding spot stimulus happens right here. So are you ready? Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> again, this happens every time we try this experiment with different animals. Uh, the impression is that the animals have uh, kind of preformed an escape plan. Maybe I'm, I'm over-interpreting, but the, the impression is that they know where the shelter is at the time that the threat appears and are just kind of recalling that, uh, uh, that knowledge of the environment and running to the place where it ought to be. So. Okay. Um, we would like now to uh, explore some of the questions that come up in this, in this context. Uh, so these are some of the topics we're working on now. Uh, there's the question of detection. How is the threat identified? Uh, what are the circuits, the neurons that, uh, uh, that uh, extract this uh, signal from the visual input? Uh, there's a decision here between two very uh, different behaviors, right? Freezing means uh, staying as still as possible, uh, escaping, run as fast as possible. So they're kind of diametrically opposite uh, uh, options. Uh, where is that uh, decision made? How is it made? And then how is that decision controlled? We know now that the choices uh, the, the depend on the animal's experience in the arena. It also depends on other aspects of its internal state. And we'd ultimately like to know how that happens as well. Um, in practice, we're working on uh, three different brain areas at this moment uh, uh, on the visual signals in the retina, because obviously that's where the visual information comes from. Uh, we're studying, uh, uh, beginning to study signals in superior colliculus. We believe that it's involved in the downstream processing of these threat signals. And then together with David Anderson, uh, we're also interested in what happens in the hypothalamus, because there's some indication that this area is involved in the modulation or control of these defensive behaviors. Okay, let's uh, start in the front, at the front end in the, in the retina. Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, as you know, the retina is this uh, layered neural circuit at the back of the eye. Uh, it uh, stretches from uh, photoreceptor cells down to retinal ganglion cells, the output neurons. Their axons form the optic nerves. Uh, there are bipolar cells that connect photoreceptors to ganglion cells. And in addition, there are lateral connections from horizontal cells in this outer layer of synapses and amacrine cells at this inner layer of synapses. Now, <clears throat> These five set classes of cells uh, are subdivided into many more subtypes of neurons. We think there are about 70 or 80 uh, types of uh, neuron in the retina that can be distinguished based on their shape, their uh, uh, structure, their synaptic connectivity, and increasingly their gene expression profiles. Uh, the bottom layer, the retinal ganglion cells, the output population alone is composed of about uh, 30 types of retinal ganglion cell. Uh, each type uh, completely tiles the visual field and is busy processing the visual signal in its own way and extracting certain features and uh, sending that particular information about that particular feature onto the brain. Now, this. Uh, uh, area of uh, um, retinal neuroscience has really been uh, uh, turbocharged, I would say, like many other parts of neuroscience, by the advent of uh, molecular genetic tools that allow us, in particular, to uh, select uh, certain subtypes of neuron in the retina 
and uh, mark them either to visualize them with fluorescent proteins or to modify them in one way or another. And here we've benefited tremendously from a, a long collaboration with Josh Sains, who's uh, here in the audience, and who contributed uh, most of the uh, mouse lines that are available today for uh, selective marking and the manipulation of, uh, of retinal neurons. Uh, here, for example, are uh, four different lines of mice in which the retinal ganglion cells are uh, stained uh, in green. And uh, you can see that uh, they are distinct in these vertical sections by where in the inner plexiform layer they ramify their dendrites. Uh, these neurons ramify at the very top layer, uh, these neurons mostly in the middle between these two red bands. And uh, the location where a ganglion cell sends its dendrites determines which types of bipolar cells and amacrine cells it gets input from and ultimately determines the visual computation that that neuron performs. So one can think about the retina as being something like 30 visual processors all in one circuit. Uh, it really processes the image in about 30 different ways and sends those onto the brain as population signals in the optic nerve. And in many of these cases, we understand what the neurons compute and even what the circuits are by which they do so. And here are a few examples. Uh, uh, we, uh, for example, found that there's a, a type of neuron that uh, exists in many species that uh, uh, responds selectively when an object moves with a different trajectory from the background of the object. And this is thought to highlight objects in the presence of uh, eye movements that uh, shift the entire image around. And uh, there's a good understanding of the circuit involving bipolar cells and amacrine cells and ganglion cells and rectification and inhibition that actually produces that particular computation. And there are other examples of uh, image computations for which we can really write down neural circuits. We can verify the neural circuits by actually injecting and uh, uh, neurons and finding their synaptic connectivities. And uh, we can also use those neural circuits as mathematical models to predict the response of this particular retinal ganglion cell. And in many cases, these models are getting very good at producing the correct uh, output signals. So today I want to talk about a particular class of retinal ganglion cells. They're called the alpha ganglion cells. And they uh, um, exist in uh, most or all mammalian retinas. Uh, and they were first described in the cat retina by virtue of being the biggest ganglion cells in the whole circuit. Uh, so they tend to have large cell bodies, large dendrites, uh, thick axons. They stain strongly for uh, neurofilament, which is presumably a structural component of all these big uh, uh, processes. Uh, they project to both of the major visual pathways. Uh, they have a very fast axonal conduction and short response latency. So when something happens in the world, the first action potentials that tell the brain about it are usually from alpha retinal ganglion cells. So we wanted to understand this uh, class of ganglion cells better in the mouse retina to try and uh, see what role they might play in encoding different kinds of visual stimuli. The key tool here was uh, another mouse line that Josh and colleagues uh, developed uh, that expresses qe recombinase in the locus of a gene for a potassium channel subunit. And the particular reason why the potassium channel subunit might be expressed in alpha cells, we don't understand at this moment, but we're just opportunistically using it as a marker for this class of neurons. So this shows these neurons labeled in the qe line. Uh, for comparison, this is an antibody to neurofilament, and this is uh, antibody to another protein called the osteopontin, which has been closely associated with the alpha retinal ganglion cells, again through work of Josh and colleagues. So this has allowed us now to go into the retina day after day and record from alpha cells and uh, learn something in one afternoon and apply what you learned the next morning to change the experiment and so on. And this kind of ability to repeatedly target the same neuron type out of 80 possible ones uh, makes a huge difference uh, in uh, just your experimental planning and in the way you learn things about the object uh, of interest. And uh, I'll just uh, I'll tell you a little bit in the next uh, few minutes what we learned about this class of ganglion cells. <clears throat> First of all, the alpha cells in the mouse come in four different types. It's interesting, if you look at the 
uh, cells face on, uh, meaning you have the retina and the flat mount under the microscope, and you look at their shapes uh, in this uh, uh, tangential plane, they are almost indistinguishable. They all have a characteristic alpha-like morphology, big cell bodies, thick dendrites, and a pretty regular dendritic tree uh, branching outward. But if you record their signals in response to visual stimuli, uh, they are very different. Here we just put a small spot on the center of the uh, retina of the alpha ganglion cell and turn the spot off and on. And you find that there are uh, two types of cells that are on cells. They respond when the light goes on. And uh, two types that are off cells, they respond when the light turns off. Within each of the two polarities, you have one type that responds in a sustained fashion, meaning they fire for the entire duration of the light on, and another type that fires in a transient fashion, only a brief burst of spikes at the onset. And vice versa, on the off side, you similarly have a cell with sustained responses and another with uh, transient responses. Now, these are just four examples, but if you look at the entire population of neurons that we recorded, they really do fall nicely into these four categories based on the dynamics of their light response. So these are firing rate as a function of time when the spot goes off and on. And you can see that the transient cells fire only transiently, and the sustained cells keep their firing rate up. If you analyze each of these by a couple of parameters, let's say the amount of uh, decline of the firing rate from the peak to the steady level, and also the decay time that it takes for that, uh, then in the scatter plot, uh, you find that the uh, neurons fall into four classes quite nicely that are separated by these two parameters. So from now on, I'm going to call these by their names, off-transient, off-sustained, on-transient, unsustained, identified by these functional parameters. It turns out that these four classes that you identify functionally are also different uh, in their shape, morphologically. Uh, <clears throat> I, I told you they look the same when you look at them face on, but in the vertical section you see they're different. Because uh, the dendrites of the uh, four types of alpha cell ramify in different, at different levels of the inner plexiform layer. The on cells ramify at the bottom, the off cells at the top, and that's expected. It's a, a, a long known result that the inner plexiform layer is divided roughly into on signals in the bottom half and off signals in the top half. But in addition, you can see that the uh, transient neurons ramify closer to the middle of the uh, inner plexiform layer and the sustained neurons closer to the outside. So even though the four types are defined functionally, they are very clearly morphologically distinct once you look at the, where their dendrites ramify. OK, uh, another oddity that uh, we encountered, which might be interesting to the biophysicists, is that uh, the action potential of these alpha ganglion cells has a strange shape. Um, when you record extracellularly, usually neurons have an uh, action potential that goes down and overshoots. Uh, these uh, uh, four types all have a little pre-spike uh, on the shoulder of the rising phase. And if you turn down the temperature of the bath a little bit, the pre-spike can actually separate completely from the main action potential. Now, <clears throat> this phenomenon is very similar to something that was described about 70 years ago uh, in uh, motor neurons. And uh, we now understand where the spike shape comes from. Uh, <clears throat> we think that the spike begins at the axon initial segment, which is the most sensitive part of the neuron, and often is a little bit uh, down the... Uh, uh, the axon from the cell body, then the current that flows in at that point is used to charge up the cell body, bring it to threshold, and produce an action potential there. And in these large neurons, where the axon initial segment is a little bit further away, that can take a few fractions of a millisecond and uh, lead to this delay between the first spike and the second spike. So we think what we're looking at is the early spike of the axon initial segment followed by a large action potential uh, that involves the cell body and ultimately the dendrites. So if that's the case, you might expect, as indeed had been observed in motor neurons, that sometimes the axon initial segment fires but fails to charge the cell body. And in fact, uh, we found that this does happen. If you record uh, with a cell-attached electrode that allows you to uh, get a high resolution on this action potential, you can see that occasionally you find a little spike, but
but not the big spike. So these are occasions where we think an action potential travels down the nerve of this ganglion cell, but fails to invade the cell body and the rest of the neuron. This may be a detail, but it is of interest when you ask uh, about the uh, uh, um, cellular processing within the ganglion cell, the fact that occasional action potentials don't backpropagate can make a big difference. Uh, of practical use uh, is the fact that we can now recognize these alpha cells also in uh, blind extracellular recordings. For example, on multi-electrode arrays where we don't have a molecular marker that uh, can be used unambiguously to uh, identify them, we can now uh, uh, recognize them by their spike shape. Okay, let me move on to talk about uh, what these alpha cells do for the mouse visual system. What do they actually encode about uh, the visual world? And let's start again with uh, some classical results from uh, uh, cat alpha cells. Uh, these date back uh, about 50 years to Christina Enroth Kugel and John Robson. And they <coughs> analyzed uh, the responses of uh, cat retinal ganglion cells with uh, si spatial sinusoid gratings. And they found, interestingly, that uh, uh, the, uh, at a certain spatial frequency, the neuron gives the highest response. But if you go down in spatial frequency, meaning uh, broader and broader fringes, uh, the response declines by about a factor of two. And uh, this is now associated, uh, we, we think of this more in spatial terms rather than spatial frequency terms, as being a consequence of center surround antagonism in the receptive field of these ganglion cells. So they respond to light with one polarity in the center and with the opposite polarity in the surround. And if you look at how uh, sinusoid gratings of different frequencies interact with this kind of spatial filter, you get this sort of bandpass response. A second feature that comes out of the classic literature of uh, uh, alpha or uh, Y cells, as, as they've been called, is that uh, their response depends strongly on the phase of the sinusoid grating. So let's start with the left-hand column, which is more of a generic type of retinal ganglion cell, uh, an X cell uh, in the cat. If you put the sinusoid grating on such that a positive fringe is over the receptive field center, you get a big response. If you put the sinusoid grating such that the negative fringe, a dark fringe, is over the receptive field center, you get an inverted response. And if you shift the grating to halfway in between, such that there's both dark and light over the receptive field center, when you turn on the grating, you get nothing. So this uh, concept or this kind of behavior is called linear spatial summation. It's as though the ganglion cell just counts the total amount of light over its receptive field center and responds accordingly. And so in this experiment where you're removing light from one side and adding it to the other side, there is no net reaction. Very different for the Y cells or the alpha cells. I'm going to use the two labels uh, interchangeably. Uh, for these neurons, no matter where you set the phase of the grating, you'll get a burst of spikes when you turn the grating on or off. Uh, even in this situation where you're uh, exciting half of the receptive field and uh, supposedly inhibiting the other half, the ganglion cell still fires at both transitions. We now know that this uh, results from what are called nonlinear subunits of the receptive field or, uh, more biologically, uh, bipolar cells with rectifying synapses. So the ganglion cell receptive field center is made up of many bipolar cells, and when you shine light on one bipolar cell and take it away from another bipolar cell, of course, one gets excited and the other one inhibited, but because of this rectification at the synapse, only the excitation goes through to the ganglion cell and will therefore make it fire every time. Okay, this uh, signature of nonlinear spatial summation has been taken as kind of a key characteristic of alpha cells and has often served to uh, identify them. Uh, what I want to ask now is, first of all, do the mouse alpha cells behave like cat alpha cells, the kind of paradigmatic, historically uh, uh, defining uh, alpha cells? And second, uh, if they do, uh, do these properties make any difference for the uh, visual encoding of natural scenes? So let's first check whether the basic uh, uh, spatial summation properties uh, are the same in the mouse ganglion cells. Um, let's look at the antagonistic surround, and yes, that uh, happens in mouse ganglion cells as well. 
if you start to, if you flash a spot of light on the ganglion cell and you start with a small spot and gradually increase it, you begin with a small response, it grows and then declines again. And that's plotted here. Peak risk firing rate is a function of radius of the spot. It grows at first while the spot begins to fill the receptive field center. And then when the spot encroaches in the surround, it declines again. And the decline is about a factor of two uh, equivalent to what was found in the alpha retinal ganglion cells of the cat. So there is an antagonistic center surround interaction, just as described uh, in the classic literature. What about the nonlinear subunits within the center? Uh, we can test that, as was done before, with uh, gratings. So <clears throat> when we put a grating on the receptive field center and carefully position it so that uh, half of the center is white and the other half is black, then we switch to the other mode. We invert the grating. We get a burst of spikes from this ganglion cell and another burst of spikes when we switch back and another burst of spikes at about 200 hertz. These are very strong responses. So yes, it is possible to drive these alpha ganglion cells by removing light from one portion of the receptive field and putting it on another one. We can make these bars finer and finer and it continues to work until eventually the bars get so fine that we think the subunits in the receptive field, the bipolar cells, can no longer resolve the grating and then you stop getting any responses. So both these spatial feature, uh, uh, spatial integration properties of ganglion cells, the center surround antagonism and the nonlinear summation over subunits exist in the mouse retina as well. We'd like to know now what these uh, neurons encode about the visual scene under uh, real natural conditions. Uh, what do I mean by natural conditions? So we take movies of the natural world and bring them back to the laboratory and shine them on the retina in a dish, record from neurons under those conditions. What are the movies? Uh, one type of movie is a mouse cam movie where a tiny video camera gets placed on the head of a mouse and we allow it to run around uh, in an arena with its friends, as you saw here. Uh, the other movie is uh, a simulation of a mouse where we put a video camera on uh, the end of a stick and uh, run it through the grass. Uh, and um, in fact, the uh, cinematographer is in the audience, uh, uh, Max Hirsch. Uh, and uh, so obviously we have uh, uh, you know, higher resolution movies uh, from uh, the simulation where uh, we can work with a big video camera rather than a really tiny one. But uh, remarkably, the responses of alpha ganglion cells to these two types of movies are very similar. And here they're illustrated with raster graphs, uh, six successive repeats of the identical movie, and uh, the average firing rate uh, as a function of time uh, throughout the movie. In gray, it's kind of hard to see. You can see the standard error of the response over trials. Same thing for the movie obtained from the uh, simulator. So at this point, all we can say is that the ganglion cells fire a lot, and they seem to be strongly modulated, firing rates of several hundred hertz. Uh, so there's obviously uh, there's a lot of interesting features in this movie that uh, elicit these ganglion cells to uh, say something to the brain. Uh, it's kind of neat to see how the sustained cells, for example, uh, the on cells and the off cells are complementary to each other. So again, I'm plotting time throughout the movie here and the firing rate of the off-sustained cells goes up in blue, and for the on-sustained cells, I've plotted it downward in gray, and you can see how these two graphs interleave very nicely, so that uh, when the on-cells go up, the off-cells come down, and vice versa. It's as though these two uh, neurons are encoding, you know, complementary uh, features of the same signal. They're really encoding uh, the same signal, but uh, with opposite polarities. And you can see a similar interdigitation, nice interdigitation for the off cells, uh, sorry, for the transient cells. Okay, that's all fine, but uh, what is it about the visual world that the neurons are reporting? Can we understand uh, what the visual features are that, uh, that they're telling the brain about? Um, <clears throat> so the classic approach to answering that question is to put together a mathematical model that uh, calculates a prediction of the firing rate from the movie and uh, compare that to the measured firing rate of the neuron. And if the uh, prediction and the real firing rate are close, then you say you've understood what the uh, computation is. Uh, but here, Brenner decided to do something else first. 
uh, she asked, uh, what can I do to the movie uh, without affecting the responses of the neurons? So she's in a way, in a directed fashion, asking what is it about this uh, movie of the natural world that actually makes the neuron tick and makes it change its response. And so we started with something really simple. We blurred the movie in a way that is reflective of the mouse eye optics so that we actually get the uh, accurate amount of blur and sharp <laughs> sharpness on the retina correct. And that made very little difference. And here's an example. The dotted line is the real response firing rate as a function of time from a particular alpha ganglion cell. And the solid blue line is the response to the modified movie. So very little difference. Then she did something more dramatic uh, and uh, inverted the movie, turned it upside down 180 degrees, and asked uh, what's the response to that movie from the same neuron. And here's a comparison. Again, dotted is the original, solid is the modified movie. Uh, here's a scatter plot, one against the other, and uh, you can see very little change in the response from this uh, major image transformation. <clears throat> and then she got more courageous and said, uh, let's divide the receptive field into center and surround, and we'll take the center to be a 200 micron radius and the surround, everything outside of there. And let's uh, completely remove the spatial structure in the surround and just calculate the average intensity there and uh, put that in a new movie where the whole surround is going cohesively with the average intensity. Again, very little difference in the response of uh, an alpha retinal ganglion cell. And she said, uh, let's just drop the surround entirely and uh, only present the center uh, with a, a movie through a, a tiny mask like that. And again, here's a comparison of original and modified scatter plot. It's very hard to see any difference in the response of the, the retinal ganglion cell. Finally, this seems awfully crass, but uh, I have to say it. Uh, she removed the structure from the center and just calculated the average intensity in that 200 micron radius and modulated the uh, stimulus accordingly. And again, uh, there was uh, very little difference in uh, how the ganglion cells responded to that. Now you might say, uh, and I wondered, is she doing something wrong? Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe she's really always presenting that. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> fortunately, there are many other ganglion cells in the retina that you could record from. You don't have to go for the fluorescent ones. And uh, if you do it for a different type of retinal ganglion cell, in this case an on-off cell, you get a completely different response, for example, to the rotated movie. Uh, there's no relationship, uh, so this is uh, not true for every neuron in the retina. Um, okay, so just to bring this home, uh, here's a summary of uh, a larger population of neurons that we analyzed. Uh, I'm plotting the co percent correlation between the firing rate under the modified movie and the firing rate under the original movie. If you simply compare one example of the original with, uh, with another one, meaning uh, this is a cross-trial correlation, you get something like 85 or 90 percent. And if you then modify the movie by blurring it, rotating, averaging the surround, leaving the surround out, and averaging the center, you find that the correlation hardly changes at all. You always have something like 70 or 80 percent correlation with the original. So all these modifications leave the response of the retinal ganglion cell unaltered. And that obviously serves now to inform a mathematical model by which we'll try to explain the response. In particular, we know we only have to pay attention to one variable as a function of time, namely the average intensity in the center. We can completely ignore spatial processing. And so let's do that. Let's try to predict the firing rate from that one variable. And uh, we started with the simplest model you can think of, an LN model that convolves the time course of this with a linear filter and then takes the output of that and runs it through a static nonlinearity. And you can estimate both the filter and the nonlinearity by standard methods from the data. And uh, here's the result. Uh, in black are the data, the measured firing rate of a ganglion cell under the movie and in red is the prediction from this very simple model. And the prediction also has about 80% correlation with uh, the uh, real response. So uh, what happened to the nonlinear subunits? Uh, uh, what happened to all that uh, nonlinear integration over space that is paradigmatic for alpha retinal ganglion cells? 
Well, you can try to put that back into the mathematical model. So instead of simulating the center, sorry, analyzing the center only by averaging over the entire region, you can put in uh, subunits uh, simulated by polar cells and give them their own nonlinearities and uh, fit a model of this type to the uh, responses. And what you find is that uh, it barely makes any difference. So uh, to the right is the correlation. Again, for each of the four alpha types, the correlation of the model with the data under a single variable, center only. And then as we go to the left here, we have 16 subunits, and there's no discernible difference in the quality of the fit. So we can say now that even though nonlinear spatial integration is a characteristic of alpha ganglion cells that have been used to identify them, it really plays very little role, if any, in the context of uh, natural scenes. And uh, I'm going to skip over this in the talk and uh, summarize a little bit what we've learned about the alpha cells in, uh, in this study. First of all, we found that they come in four types that are symmetric, uh, two on types, two off types, two transient, uh, and uh, um, we found that uh, the nonlinear summation of alpha cells seems to play very little role in encoding of natural stimuli. In fact, you can explain almost everything they do by only looking at one pixel of the image that's the size of the receptive field center. This is useful to know because uh, the alpha cells are thought to be a prime uh, pathway to both the superior colliculus and to the thalamus and cortex. They obviously are very active. They're firing half the time during uh, these natural scenes. And so having a quantitative mathematical model of what these neurons encode is going to be useful in thinking about processing now. So let me get back then to the relationships to uh, behavior, and particularly these defensive behaviors. Um, we'd like to understand better uh, how the retinal ganglion cells are related to these innate behaviors of the animal. And I should say that uh, you know, a big mystery in the field, a big question I would say, is why are there 30 types of retinal ganglion cell? Why did nature choose to split the visual signal up into all these differentiated pathways so early on? And one idea is that uh, perhaps each of these ganglion cells is used for a particular uh, low-level kind of visual behavior. I mean, there are lots of low-level tasks we have to do, like opening and closing the pupil, uh, keeping the eyes uh, uh, centered, um, uh, moving along with the environment, stabilizing ourselves relative to the environment, getting out of the way of obstacles, uh, flinching away uh, from uh, branches that are about to hit us in the face, uh, and running away from owls if you're a mouse. Yeah. So perhaps these uh, many channels of visual information are kind of adapted to take care of some of these low-level uh, tasks already. So to try and, uh, and map the uh, classes of ganglion cells onto visual behaviors, we used an approach where we, we try to silence or remove ganglion cells from the retina and ask what that does to the responses or to the reactions of, uh, of the animal, the behavior of retinal ganglion cells. Uh, here we use two different kinds of modifications. Uh, one makes use of this uh, KCNG Cree line in order to ablate uh, classes of retinal ganglion cells. And uh, we know that uh, this ablation involves the four alpha types I just talked about, but we believe that there are other neurons in the retina that are affected as well. So this is not a, uh, a completely clean uh, and specific ablation yet. But there's an orthogonal ablation we tried in which we removed the, uh, the neurons that express choline acetyl transferase. These are starburst amacrine cells that, as many of you know, are involved in direction selectivity of uh, retinal ganglion cells. And so this modification, which I'll call the C ablation, uh, will remove direction selectivity from seven different types of retinal ganglion cells. And now the question is, uh, what are the effects of these two ablations on uh, looming reactions, for example, or on other types of visual behaviors? Now, one could imagine either of these two groups uh, involved in the looming reaction. For example, one of the alpha cells, the off-transient cell, has been called a looming detector. We don't quite believe that anymore because I just told you that they respond to all kinds of things, just depending on the intensity in that center pixel. Um, but uh, equally, these other direction-selective neurons might be involved in defining an expanding uh, uh, dark disk. 
by uh, recording the motion of the different parts of the edge of the disk. So what are the effects of uh, making these two ablations on uh, the behavior of uh, the animals? So <clears throat> the K ablation turns out uh, reduces the looming reactions by a large factor, uh, by about uh, two thirds or so. Both uh, freezing and escaping are affected by ablation of these neurons. Whereas uh, the other major ablation, where you eliminate all the starburst amacrine cells, has no effect on the uh, behavior of the animal under looming stimuli. Now you might wonder, did we just uh, you know, generically uh, destroy the uh, retina under uh, uh, these conditions? So you want another behavior ideally as a, as a control. And here we use the optomotor behavior by which animals try to turn their head along with the direction of a moving grating. You can kind of uh, see the circularity of the axis of the bars of the grating. And uh, <clears throat> this behavior is completely unaffected under the uh, K ablation that affects alpha cells and some other types of neurons, whereas it's uh, reduced to zero uh, under the C ablation that affects the starburst amacrine cells. So we have uh, kind of opposite effects on the behavior of uh, the, or these two behaviors, at least, of the mouse from these two different ablations. And uh, these are both still rather crude ablations, but there's a sense that uh, there's some dissociation of the roles of different ganglion cells for, for different downstream behaviors, for these low-level behaviors. So obviously, we would like to now uh, refine these ablations so that we get down to ideally single uh, retinal ganglion cell types and uh, understand better how they feed these uh, downstream. Let me, in the last few minutes, uh, say a little bit about uh, how we're going about uh, investigating downstream processing. And this is uh, only to give you a sense of uh, uh, what we'd like to do. There are no uh, hard results uh, here yet. But obviously, a decision has to be made uh, where, to, where to look next, because the retina projects to uh, about uh, a dozen different areas in the brain, but the major pathways are one to the lateral geniculate and from there to the cortex, and the other to the superior colliculus. So we think that the cortex is uh, not involved or not necessary for the uh, defensive reactions in particular. Uh, and uh, here's an anecdote that uh, uh, was told to uh, me by uh, Zhenhua uh, Tsang, uh, a, uh, competitor, I should say, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the anecdote is that uh, he's been working with uh, a mouse that is uh, unencumbered by uh, forebrain structures like uh, cortex and hippocampus. Uh, it's the result of a, a fortuitous uh, um, mutation. Uh, there's a transcription factor EMX1 that comes on when the uh, cortex begins to develop. And as soon as that uh, comes on, this Cree line uh, uh, eliminate the ability of neurons to divide. So basically, the precursor cells can never form these structures. And uh, here it looks like the technician dropped part of the section, but actually, the animal never had the uh, top of its brain. Uh, nevertheless, these animals uh, react just fine to looming stimuli, and they can even remember where the nest is. Uh, so something for Matt to ponder. Well, <laughs> anyway, so we, we have a sense that the, the other major pathway is the more likely candidate, and uh, we're now uh, trying to follow the uh, signals from the retina into the superior colliculus, uh, ideally under conditions where we can still monitor some of these uh, looming reactions. Uh, the superior colliculus is a uh, layered structure. Uh, the top layers receive inputs from retinal ganglion cells. Uh, the middle layers actually get all kinds of multisensory information. There's some tactile information there. There's uh, auditory and even some olfactory signals. And the bottom layers of the superior colliculus are already organized a bit more towards uh, motor uh, output. Uh, and from the primate literature, of course, we know that it's intimately involved in uh, controlling Psychotic eye movements in animals that do less of that, like rodents, uh, it is involved apparently in directing animals towards or away from objects in the environment. So you can stimulate in the uh, bottom layers of the superior colliculus and get things that look like defensive reactions. So what we'd like to believe is that uh, somewhere in the structure there is a kind of gradual processing of signals 
uh, through the layers that perhaps leads to a refinement of these motor instructions uh, for defensive reactions uh, near the bottom layers. So we're taking uh, two technical approaches to this. In both cases, we have uh, uh, wake behaving head fixed animals. In one case, uh, we put a window into the skull and uh, image uh, neurons in the superior part of the, uh, the top layers of the superior colliculus. Uh, my former postdoc, Evan Feinberg, uh, developed a method by which he can uh, push, gently nudge the cortex aside so as to reveal about a square millimeter of superior colliculus. And that allows us to uh, record calcium signals from the neurons in that, uh, that top layer. Um, and these neurons in the top layer of the colliculus are uh, respond strongly to looming stimuli and much less so to one of the control stimuli that uh, is uh, less uh, effective also in the eliciting these uh, behavioral reactions. But as I said, we'd really like to understand what happens uh, during processing along vertical uh, progression through the uh, superior colliculus. And here we've started working with uh, silicon prong electrodes. Uh, they're just about long enough to reach all the way from the top to the bottom of this uh, brain structure. And uh, here's an example of a section in which the uh, fluorescent dye uh, that was on the silicon prong electrode got wiped off. So you can actually see where the electrodes were located when we recorded from this animal. And just give you a glimpse of what happens there. These are completely raw uh, electrode signals, no spike sorting done yet, and so on. But just uh, you can see how in response to looming stimuli, in the top layers, you get responses that repeat more or less identically every time you repeat this. Play. And then something interesting happens in the bottom layers where uh, suddenly here's a neuron that uh, recognizes only the first uh, display of that looming stimulus and uh, ignores uh, subsequent ones. So uh, we're very interested in finding out what kind of uh, filtering happens, what kind of salience uh, filtering uh, occurs in these circuits. Uh, if we do the same thing with a white expanding disk that, that we know is ineffective in eliciting behaviors, these neurons are no longer interested neurons on top are still encoding that. So this is just a, a, a kind of the feel for how we'd like to go about uh, following these signals now through the structure in the superior colliculus, making use of everything we've learned about the retinal output, uh, because that, of course, is the input signal to this brain area. So let me just uh, summarize again. These are the major questions that uh, we'd like to go after. We think uh, we've uh, I learned something about uh, the circuits that are involved in detection, or at least in feeding the detection stage. Uh, this, uh, how the decision is made is uh, still completely uh, open. And uh, we've learned some things about uh, how the choice is modulated uh, through uh, interaction with signals in the hypothalamus that I'll tell you about some other time. But meanwhile, let me thank the people whose work I talked about. Uh, Melis Gilmatz, uh, uh, developed the uh, experiments on the looming uh, behaviors. She took all the movies that I showed you. Uh, Brenna worked on the alpha retinal ganglion cells. Uh, Evan Feinberg developed the optical approach to superior colliculus. Steve Van Leeuwen completed the electrical recordings I mentioned at the very end. Our collaborators, Mu Kiao and uh, Josh Sains, of course, were essential in uh, everything I talked about. Um, uh, more recent collaborations with uh, David Anderson, Prabhat Kunwar, are uh, trying to get at the kind of uh, emotional components of these uh, defensive reactions. Uh, and finally, a bit of uh, shameless advertising. Uh, there's still uh, a room in the lab. Uh, it doesn't look quite this empty anymore, but there's still space for your own experiments if you want to join us. And uh, these pictures were taken in January, so uh, they're <laughs> not, not completely reflective of uh, what, what it looks like today. But uh, anyway, thank you very much.